Steve, for those kind words. Uh, what I want to remind you is the great rival of Sydney University is the Australian National University, not Melbourne <laughs> University. Um, I also want to thank the Observer Research Foundation and the Asia Society for uh, hosting this wonderful event. Uh, this is the first time uh, I'm in, uh, in, 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 in this city, in Mumbai. Uh, usually when I go to India, it's always Delhi, so it's nice to know that there isn't India outside New Delhi. Now, I uh, thoroughly endorse what the uh, ORF is trying to achieve, that is, uh, promote cooperation and friendship uh, with various countries throughout Asia. But I think an important element uh, which is sometimes missing in the pursuit of that, particularly uh, when we are talking about China, is to be very clear-eyed about some of the uh, political economy developments within China, um, some of the foreign policy aspects, and I think the more clear-eyed and honest we are with the Chinese, um, I think the better basis uh, we have for moving ahead. Now, like almost every country in Asia, uh, I come from a country, Australia, uh, that is intensely debating the implications of China's rise. Now, China's political, military and strategic strengths uh, are clearly based on uh, economic growth and size, and the leaders of China have done a, a spectacular job of achieving that over 30 years. Now, this is combined with the fact, and perfectly legitimate, that China is an ambitious rising power. Now, national wealth and size obviously makes you relevant. Uh, it gives you a place at any multilateral, regional or global table. Uh, it gives you more money to spend on defence, uh, and it makes it much more difficult for outside powers uh, to dictate to China uh, what China should do. But China, and once again, this is a completely natural phenomenon of a rising power, uh, China, like any other uh, country rising, wants influence, and if you want to have influence, you need leverage. That is, you need the capacity to put uh, pressure on other states to change their policies or else adopt policies uh, that they otherwise wouldn't adopt. Now, this is not at all unique to China, but uh, uh, certainly this is very much in, in uh, Beijing's mind. Now, a growing number of people, particularly in my country, and, I, and I also I assume in India, uh, look at China's spectacular economic growth, and they naturally conclude uh, that as China's economy gets larger, its leverage in Asia will increase pr proportionately. Now, after all, every source of power and influence, military, uh, strategic, political, uh, is ultimately based on economic strength in any sustainable uh, context, and this is clearly the advantage that China has uh, over, for example, a country like the Soviet Union. But I want to spend the next 15 minutes, uh, without taking away from China's achievements, I want to spend the next 15 minutes discussing uh, some of the domestic, uh, economic and strategic uh, reasons why China's leverage in a region uh, will not be proportionate to its raw economic size. Uh, in a sense, uh, I think the Chinese capacity to exercise leverage uh, is actually quite inefficient. Now, as you know, uh, China is not blind, like any other country, China is not blind to the idea that economic size uh, can improve its bargaining position. Uh, we heard uh, or, or we saw the uh, statements by Beijing after America uh, delivered its uh, 2010 arms package to Taiwan uh, that Beijing was, would consider imposing bans on American firms and companies such as Boeing. Now, in documents uh, that I've looked at within China, in documents given to me by uh, Chinese uh, officials and also officials throughout Asia, uh, Chinese officials are consistently speculating uh, about exploiting its economic rise to influence the policies of other countries. Now, once again, this is a perfectly natural and legitimate venture. Now, the proportionate acquisition of Chinese leverage uh, based on Chinese economic growth is essentially based on these two assumptions. One, as Asia's most important trading hub, uh, and two, as the fastest growing economy in the world, perhaps uh, India will take that mantle soon, but as the fastest growing major economy in the world, uh, 
uh, China can put pressure on international governments by selectively denying uh, international firms and even countries access to its economy and its markets. Now, technically, China or any other country can do this. But even if China does this, and it won't, but even if China does this, uh, the, its capacity to extract concessions from other major countries uh, is a lot less formidable uh, than is sometimes made out. Now, we hear a lot of comments about uh, how important China is as a trading partner, and that's undoubtedly true. For countries such as Japan and South Korea, and my country, Australia, uh, China is now our largest trading partner. So the question is, can China exercise leverage over these countries? Well, I think it depends on the structure of the trade with these countries. And the key is the proportion of trade that is processing trade, that is importing parts from Asia or other areas, uh, assembling it in China, adding value, and then exporting it out again uh, to some other market. Now, my estimates from my studies is that uh, 50 to 70 percent of all China's trade is processing trade. Uh, about 75 percent of processing imports into China come from the rest of Asia, and about 60 percent of the processed exports go to non-Asian OECD countries. Uh, the regional free trade agreements that China has signed with ASEAN and other countries in, in the region uh, is very much about streamlining processing trade. Now, China could try to get its way by uh, imposing selective trading bans on major firms or even major, major countries. Uh, but if it did, uh, production chains would be severely disrupted at great cost to all parties, including China. Uh, Asian firms would eventually find other manufacturing plants uh, in Asia, for example, Vietnam, even if this is costly and time-consuming. Uh, and besides, China needs a technology transfer uh, that comes from uh, foreign firms operating in its markets. Now, the uh, export sector in China uh, employs somewhere between 150 and 200 million people, and the uh, government, understandably, in China cannot uh, do too much damage to this export sector. Now, what about uh, using or withdrawing access to the Chinese market and the Chinese consumer to uh, give Beijing potential leverage. Now, uh, Beijing has done this not to any great degree, but selectively uh, with some smaller Southeast Asian countries, uh, for example, Malaysia and Singapore, uh, with moderate success. But once again, I think China's capacity to use this tactic as a point of leverage uh, has significant limitations. And the reasons for these limitations uh, go to the heart of the Chinese political economy uh, and how the uh, Chinese economy actually works. Now, the Chinese economy constitutes a large uh, component of global growth, but it is not nearly as important a driver of global growth. I say this because 50 to 60 per cent of, of China's economic growth, of China's GDP growth each year, uh, is driven by domestically funded fixed investment, basically building things. This rose to 80 to 85 per cent in 2009 2010 uh, before falling to about 60 per cent currently, which is the highest of any modern economy uh, in world history. Basically, uh, the government's uh, dominance over the banking sector, uh, combined with capital controls, means that uh, the state owned banks have almost perfect savings capture. Uh, the Chinese citizens have to de deposit their money into state-owned banks or have very little alternative. Now, as a comparison, uh, foreign direct investment in China uh, is currently about US $105 billion, which is very large, uh, but total domestic bank loans in 2009 was US $1.4 trillion and US $1.2 trillion in 2010. Uh, total fixed uh, domestic-driven investment, that is investment driven by uh, domestic sources of capital, is about US $2.5 trillion each year. So that really puts uh, foreign direct investment into context. Now, 75% of all loans from China's state-owned banks go to state-owned or state-controlled companies, SOEs for short. Uh, only about 5 to 10% actually go to private domestic firms. In addition, 
uh, the most lucrative and important sectors of the economy are actually reserved for SOEs. Uh, and private and uh, foreign firms, or particularly private domestic firms, uh, are formally or informally denied access to about a dozen of the key markets. The point I'm trying to make is that the political economy in China is set up in such a way that state-owned enterprises are in a dominant position to uh, benefit from economic growth. China is not uh, accurately characterised as a private uh, sector-driven free market economy. Uh, it's a model I, I describe as uh, economic nationalism or a corporate state model. Now, with some exceptions, notably the very vibrant export manufacturing sector in China, uh, foreign firms actually don't have a lot of uh, great access to the Chinese market as it stands, uh, meaning that China cannot significantly use the carrot uh, and stick of access as a leverage point. Uh, where China needs advanced technology or technology transfer, uh, China will uh, insist on joint ventures, which, once again, this is something the Japanese did, uh, and this is designed to hasten technology transfer from uh, more advanced, particularly Western and Japanese companies, into the Chinese economy. Now, why has China done this? Um, I've looked at um, the structure of the political economy in China, uh, in the 1980s, 1990s, and over the last decade. Uh, and the uh, apparent reason is that this, what I would call the state corporate structure, uh, really took root from the mid-1990s onwards. Uh, there is an element, there's a political motivation uh, to this kind of state-owned dominant structure. And one of these uh, motivations, and we have to be upfront about this, is that uh, the Chinese Communist Party uh, is very eager to remain the dominant dispenser of business, professional and commercial opportunities uh, in the country. Now, the idea here, um, and once again, other countries have done this, but not to the same scale, the idea here is to ensure that the rising middle classes, uh, the futures of the rising middle classes, are tied to the future of the Chinese Communist Party. And you can only achieve this political economy structure if state-owned enterprises actually dominate uh, the Chinese economy. Now, this is brought out in the fact that the urban middle classes, the elites in China, are the strongest supporters of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, there are around 85 million members of the CCP. Uh, about three quarters of these are urban elites. Uh, they quite openly admit that they joined the CCP uh, in order to get ahead. That is just a fact of how things actually work in China. Uh, incidentally, um, a lot of American leaders uh, uh, openly chose to engage China and gave the explicit justification to their populations that uh, promoting economic growth in China would hasten political reforms. The Chinese, in a sense, are correct to be suspicious that America still seeks the uh, democratization of China. Uh, this is one reason why uh, political reform hasn't uh, taken place in China, even though economic growth has reached such uh, phenomenal heights, and that is you don't actually have the rise of an independently wealthy middle class. Therefore, the middle classes, and that's where, uh, in urbanizing countries, uh, it's the middle classes that essentially decide the political futures of the country. Now, this is all to make the point that China doesn't actually offer extensive market access to foreign firms, uh, and they'll resist offering widespread access to foreign firms in the foreseeable future. Uh, given this political economic structure, uh, Beijing has the broad attitude that if it gives up too much ground in terms of market access, uh, in terms of economic access, uh, to either domestic private firms or foreign firms, uh, you lose your grip on uh, being the driver of the economy and ultimately you may lose your grip on political power. Now, how can China translate economic size into proportionate strategic leverage? For that, two things need to happen. China needs to do two things. First, it needs the leverage that comes from actually allowing and potentially denying foreign firms uh, from entering its domestic market. That's obvious. Second, 
China needs to be the dominant domestic market uh, itself. China needs to become the dominant centre of domestic consumption in the region and in the world. Now, if it were, China would be the end point for imports, not just uh, the central hub for processing trade. And if so, China would truly be a global driver of economic growth, not just a large component of global economic growth. Now, size matters, and China's domestic consumption is considerable. It's about roughly the size of a country like France's. Now, this is significant, but it's no, uh, by no means dominant. Uh, China's share of public domestic consumption, that is consumption by uh, the state sector, is also much higher in, uh, in the country than in other major economies. And significantly, government procurement uh, is off limits for most foreign firms. There are also a few reasons why domestic consumption uh, is unlikely to just suddenly take off in the future in China. The first reason, uh, the state-led model of development which I've characterised uh, means that the state sector rises rapidly while the household sector uh, will, will always lag behind. Uh, for example, the wealth of the state corporate sector has been growing by around 15 to 20 per cent each year over the last 10 years. Uh, in contrast, the private household sector has been growing by 3 to 5 per cent each year. Two, uh, to pursue this state-led uh, fixed investment growth model, state-owned banks need to give state-owned companies cheap loans. That's, that's how you do it. The only way you can do this is to offer real negative deposit interest rates uh, to Chinese citizens. Now, this effectively means, in technical terms, that the Chinese citizens are subsidising the uh, state-owned enterprises. Now, despite 10% growth in China, and these are the Chinese government's figures, not mine, uh, you've actually seen net household incomes uh, in China of around three to 400 million people stagnate or decline over the last 10 years. The third reason is that China is soon to uh, confront a serious demographic problem, which you probably know about. Uh, China will be the first major country uh, in modern history to grow old before the country grows rich on a per capita basis. Now, in this kind of uh, structure, people aren't about to just withdraw their money from the banks and start spending. Now, I'm not denying at all that China's economic size or uh, impressive military capabilities is not significant. It is. The point is more that China's economic size will not translate to a proportionate political or strategic leverage in the, in the foreseeable future. Uh, in fact, I think the Chinese way of acquiring political leverage is, uh, to be frank, quite inefficient. Uh, occasionally, it's based on... Uh, intimidation, but it's largely based on raw size. So in that sense, it's, it's actually a, quite an inefficient way of acquiring leverage. Now, no one wants to um, have bad relations with China. It's, it's, it's an important, legitimate rising power in the region, and it's too important a country uh, to, to have bad relations with China. But this means that the Chinese economy would need to reach an overwhelming and enormous size to exercise the kind of leverage that some people believe that China will have uh, and uh, for the reasons that I mentioned, I don't actually think uh, this will occur. Now, if uh, there are some of you who disagree with my proposition that China hasn't got the proportionate strategic leverage, consider this fact. China is now the second largest economy in the world, uh, but it has not managed to change the strategic alignment of, of even one major Asian country. Now, this tells me that Beijing's capacity to translate economic size into strategic outcomes is often overstated. And in some senses, the China threat uh, uh, scenario is, is therefore overstated. Now, we also see the situation, um, and once again, uh, we have to be frank about this, this, uh, this situation, that even as China grows economically larger, and even as trade deepens with China and China becomes a much more important trading partner for regional countries, all key capitals in a region are hedging closer and closer with America militarily and strategically uh, and with each other uh, in anticipation of potential 
uh, disruptions caused by China's rise. Now, let me end uh, by offering a few thoughts on China's economic, uh, social, and political tra trajectory, which I believe was in the uh, blurb that, that you have. Uh, so far, uh, China has defied all expectations, or all Western expectations, I should say, that its rising middle classes will soon demand political reform and democracy. Now, I have already argued that in the current political economic uh, structure, the middle classes are the ones who potentially have the most to lose from, from uh, political reform. Hence, China's middle classes would only demand political change uh, in the event of uh, the CCP's failure to deliver them further prosperity. Now, what are the chances of economic uh, and social trouble, uh, if, if not even turmoil? Well, I believe that it's conceivable and it's something that I, the Chinese leaders themselves think very much about and it's something we need to, to also consider. The image of China as ordered, well-governed, uh, is in some respects uh, not entirely accurate. Now, the image of India is that of a chaotic uh, democratic system. Yes, that's correct, but uh, China too has its problems. Economically, uh, the basic problem is that it's getting more and more expensive and inefficient uh, to pursue this state-led uh, fixed investment strategy that keeps its economy going. Now remember that 75% of all formal finance in the country uh, goes to the 130,000 or so central and locally managed SOEs. Now even amongst the better run uh, centrally managed SOEs, uh, and some, some of these companies, PetroChina, Chinelco, uh, China Mobile, etc., uh, they do enormously well. But even, uh, even considering that, 80% of all the profits produced by the central SOEs are produced by 12 companies. Now, the performance of the locally managed SOEs uh, are even more worrying. I've looked at dozens of case studies uh, of local SOEs in various regions and provinces, uh, and my summary, which uh, is consistent with the summary of other researchers, is this. In, 19%, in, in 1978, 19% uh, of these local SOEs were unprofitable. Uh, in 1997, 40% were unprofitable. Uh, in 2009, 53% of these SOEs are unprofitable. Now, few people realise, uh, you know, we've heard about the banking catastrophes in, in America and the bailouts and so on. A few people realise that China has spent half a trillion US dollars uh, from 1998 to 2006 bailing out its banks. This is even before the 58% force expansion of the bank's loan books that occurred from 2009-2010. So in two years alone, the, the loans issued by banks increased 58%. Estimates by international accounting firms such as uh, Ernst & Young, PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, are that the ratio of bad loans in, in a Chinese banking system uh, amounts to well above 100% of GDP despite the official figures. Now, because Chinese state-owned banks have almost perfect savings capture uh, due to the virtual monopoly, and because there are capital controls in place, uh, these banks have enough liquidity to continue this stimulus of the economy for quite a, quite a while longer. Uh, but even China's Premier Wen Jiaobao for the last eight years has repeatedly warned, uh, and this is a quote, that China's growth model is unsustainable, uncoordinated, unstable and unbalanced. He has consistently used those terms over the last eight years. But I think the real danger in China, um, and, and this would create very unpredictable consequences, is social and political. As I mentioned, child, China is not uh, an orderly, or as orderly and peaceful a place as is, is sometimes believed. Now in 2010, uh, Chinese officials admitted uh, to there being over 130,000 instances of mass unrest. Mass unrest being defined as 15 or more people uh, violently protesting against government officials. Although many uh, private groups and institutions in China and Hong Kong believe that the number is closer to 300 or 350,000. Now this has risen from just a few thousand instances in the 1990s, meaning that discontentment is rising even as Chinese GDP rises.
Now, some of these protests involve tens of thousands of people. They're not insignificant. Uh, they, these protesters are not calling for democracy, but they are uh, protesting against land seizures, corruption, illegal taxes. Effectively, uh, it's a protest of frustration and a desire to attain justice. So far, most of these protests have occurred outside of the uh, cities, the urban centres in China. Um, and uh, whilst they remain outside the urban centres, uh, I don't think you'll see the prospect of uh, uh, the kind of situation that occurred in 1989. But the protests are growing. And uh, if you look at the Chinese budgets, they spend uh, American dollars, uh, $100 billion a year uh, on the People's Armed Police. That is an 800,000 strong uh, paramilitary group in addition to the police forces, in addition to the People's Liberation Army, and their sole purpose is to ensure that social unrest doesn't get out of control. Now, to me, uh, this is not evidence of a stable, ordered society. The Chinese, uh, the leaders in Beijing know full well, and, and they, they openly admit it, that the greatest threat to China is domestic, it's not external. Now, my conclusion, uh, growth in China will inevitably slow uh, for, for the factors that I mentioned. <laughs> Um, and when it does, I think two, one of two things will happen. The good scenario is that there is a fairly equitable transfer of wealth from the state corporate sector to the private household sector. Now, if that occurs, I think the economic and uh, social transition will be peaceful. Uh, I think the Chinese Communist Party would actually maximise their chances of remaining in power were that to, to occur. Uh, and I think a more stable China would actually... Uh, allow China to be a much more effective strategic player in the region. Now, if there isn't this transfer of wealth from the corporate to the private sector and uh, growth slows, if I'm correct about those two factors, uh, then I think China is in for a very difficult, uh, unpredictable uh, transition. Now, I'll end there. Um, Ajit has promised me that he will promote robust discussion. Um, and uh, thank you. Thank you for your time. <laughs>